right, so we're going to try and go through the, the basic message of, of the Bible from start to finish. And if we can just imagine that you're opening the New Testament for the first time, I know it's difficult to imagine that, that you are opening this book, this New Testament, for the first time. And you, like an intelligent person, you start reading a book at the beginning, and you want to know what it says. And you've got a load of names, and you think, oh, hang, what's this? The genealogy. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So when Matthew preached the gospel, as he understood it, he started off by saying, Jesus, you know, is the descendant of David and the descendant of Abraham. Well, that sounds a strange start to preaching the gospel. But in, uh, in Galatians, Paul says, and I'll just read it to you, Galatians 3 verse 8, Paul says that <clears throat> the gospel was preached in advance to Abraham when he was told, in you will all the nations be blessed. So if we can understand what God told Abraham, you understand the gospel. Because Paul says that the gospel, the good news, was preached to Abraham. <clears throat> to Abraham. So the gospel actually began right back there in the book of Genesis. It's not so that it just began with Jesus. It's like a golden thread that runs all the way through the whole Bible. So we want to put meaning into words. We want to understand what we mean by these terms. We talk about the gospel. We talk about believe the gospel. But what, what does this mean? What is the gospel? And Jesus, we're told, went around Galilee preaching, Matthew 4, verse 23, preaching the gospel, or the good news, about the kingdom of God. So putting meaning into words, what is this gospel? Well, remember that Paul said the gospel was preached to Abraham when God spoke to Abraham. So what did God tell Abraham? You can read it in Genesis chapter 12, where God said to Abraham, I'm just reading it, get out of your country, he lived in Ur of the Chaldees in Babylon, well, that way. Get out of your country, leave your relatives, leave your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. All of the peoples of the earth will be blessed in you. So God told Abraham that he was going to be blessed and he was going to be a blessing, and that he would become a great nation. Well, a bit further on in Genesis 17, verse 8, God says to Abraham that he's going to have a son. Well, Abraham didn't have a son by Sarah, but God said she would have a child. And he said, and I will give to you and to your seed after you the land in which you're traveling, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So. He says to Abraham that Abraham is going to have a seed, and a seed really refers to a son or a great descendant. He is going to have a great descendant, and Abraham and this seed were going to have everlasting life in the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. So then the idea of everlasting life began right back there in the Old Testament. It didn't just begin with uh, Jesus and the New Testament talking about live forever. The idea of everlasting life began right back there. And he was told that he would possess, possess this land. It would be his inheritance. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 5, Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. So inheritance is the same idea. If you inherit something, it was promised to you. And it was promised to Abraham and to his seed or his son. Let's go a bit further then. God has promised Abraham blessing, that he would be a blessing and uh, he, he would have a son, a seed, who would become many, and him and his seed would have eternal life and eternal inheritance of the earth, and I will be your God, a personal relationship with God. 
you go a bit further, Genesis 22, God says, I will bless you greatly and I will multiply your seed greatly like the stars of the sky and like the sand which is on the seashore. In your seed will all the nations of the earth be blessed. So then he says that this one seed is going to become many, as many as the stars of the sky. Well, the way to understand the Bible is to see what the Bible says about itself. When you come to the New Testament, you find these promises to Abraham explained. And <clears throat> Peter says in Acts 3, 25 and 26, he quotes the promise to Abraham saying, and in your descendant will all the families of the earth be blessed. And he says to the Jews that were listening to him, to you first, God, having raised up Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning every one of you away from your sins. So then the blessing, the blessing is the blessing of forgiveness of sins. And not only forgiveness, but in being turned away from our sins. And what we all need, I think, just as much as forgiveness, is for God to turn us away from our sins, to give us that new psychology, that new spirit, that new way of thinking, of being, of understanding life, that new world view, that will turn us away from sin. And this is exactly what these promises to Abraham so long ago were about. The blessing was of forgiveness and being turned away from our sins. And the, the great descendant of Abraham, Peter says, is Jesus. Well, Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, and he says to Abraham, where well, the promise is spoken, and to his seed. He didn't say seeds in the plural, but in the singular, and to your seed, who is Christ. He's quoting there from Galatians 3, 16. So then, the one special son of Abraham was Jesus Christ. It's through him that all this blessing and eternal life on earth uh, is made possible. But you remember the one son, the one seed, was to become many, a great nation, as many as the stars in the sky. How does that happen? If the one seed is Jesus, how does he become many? Well, Paul goes on there and says, as many of you, this is Galatians 3.27, as many of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's no Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female, you're all one in Christ Jesus, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and the heirs according to the promise. So then, by being baptized into Christ, all that is true of Jesus becomes true of us. He was the seed of Abraham, so are we. He and Abraham are to inherit the earth forever. That was the promise. And we also are going to receive that same promise. So you see why the gospel was preached to Abraham. And by being baptised, we can become part of this great plan that God started having with Abraham and his, uh, and his seed. So what happened to Abraham? He left all that he knew. He started this journey, like we start a journey towards God's kingdom, but he died. There's a chapter in the Bible, in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, that talks about all the faithful people who lived, or well, many of them, and it talks about Abraham and Sarah. It says that by faith Abraham, he faithfully obeyed, left for the place which he was to receive for an inheritance afterwards, and he left not knowing where he was going to. So he didn't get the inheritance in this life. Hebrews 11 verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received what God promised. But God keeps his promises. These people died without having received what God promised. Again, Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. These all who had faith did not receive the fulfillment of the promise God having provided some better thing involving us, that without us they should not be made perfect. 
In other words, we're all going to get, all the believers get the fulfillment of the promise at the same time. So it's not a case that one person dies, goes to heaven, gets their reward. Ten years later, someone else dies, goes to heaven, gets the fulfillment of the promise. No, we all at the same time will receive this promise. And when is that? It will be when Jesus comes back to the earth, Abraham will be resurrected along with all those that have believed and will receive what God promised, everlasting life in God's kingdom here on the earth. Now from that it follows that we do not receive the promised reward, the salvation, when we die. It's when Jesus comes back. And death, according to the Bible, is unconsciousness. In the Psalm, Psalm 146, verses 3 and 4, Don't put your trust in princes. Each of them is merely a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs and he returns to the dust. In that very day, his thoughts perish. So when we die, we go back to the dust. And in that moment, our consciousness, our thinking, stops. Now this is not popular news because every culture, everywhere, all over the world, has thought up various clever ways to get around the problem of death and to try to say that death is not really death. So let me just underline the point in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 18. I said in my heart, as for the sons of men, God tests them so that they may see that they themselves are like animals. In other words, the test of God is whether we will accept that we are just like animals animals or whether we will be proud and think we're better and the bible goes on what happens to the sons of men happens to animals even the same thing happens to them as one dies so the other dies yes they all have one breath man has no advantage over the animals all go to one place all are from the dust and all turn to dust again ecclesiastes 9 verse 5 and 6 the living know they will die but the dead don't know anything their love, their hatred, their envy has perished. They have no more a portion in anything that's done in this world. So then it's tragic, isn't it? But all our love, all that we have fought for, struggled for, hated, loved, it all finishes and we are unconscious. And this is why the Bible emphasizes the hope of the resurrection of the body. You remember in the Garden of Eden, you remember what happened there, that uh, the snake said to Eve, go on, eat the, eat the fruit of the tree, you will not surely die. You shall not surely die. And so she believed him, and she ate the fruit, and God punished them and said, you will now return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, that's just what we're reading there in Ecclesiastes. But every culture, it seems to me, all around the world has got this idea that somehow death is not really death and that you will not surely die, that somehow you will go on. And yet we are not less than human, but we are also not more than human. And so, as I say, the Bible emphasizes the resurrection of the body. Philippians 3, 20 and 21, we eagerly wait for the coming of the Saviour, the Lord Jesus. We're eagerly waiting for the second coming. Now there would be no need to eagerly want the coming of Jesus if when you die you, you zip off upstairs, as it were, to a great life in heaven. And it says we're eagerly waiting for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. So we will have a body like Jesus had. Now after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared in a bodily form. He said to the disciples, handle me and see, touch me. And they put, their, they put a finger in his uh, hands where the nails had been. He ate, bread, he ate uh, fish and, uh, and honeycomb to prove to them that he was real. There's a wonderful passage in 1 Corinthians 15 that 
talks all about the resurrection of the body. Paul says, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all remain asleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. And then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So the hope of the Christian is of an end of death through a resurrection of the body. And that will happen when Jesus comes back, because flesh and blood, as we now have, cannot inherit God's kingdom. And again, you notice the, the language of inheritance, cannot inherit. And we will inherit what we are promised. The inheritance is what was promised to Abraham and his seed, that is the Lord Jesus, the inheritance of this earth forever. Now, I would just like to uh, make a slight digression and just underline that in the Bible, hell refers to the grave. The Bible, of course, is written not in English, but in, in Hebrew, mainly in the Old Testament, and in Greek in the New Testament. And in, in the Old Testament, this word Sheol is used. It's a Hebrew word that it simply means a covered place, the grave. And in 1 Samuel 2, verse 6, Hannah says, God kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol, to the grave, and raises up. So Sheol means the grave. Hell is the grave. And in fact, in a lot of modern English versions, you don't read much about hell. You just read about the grave. Another one, Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah? He gets swallowed by, the, by the, the big fish. And he says, I called out to God, and he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and God heard my voice, Jonah 2, verse 2. So where was he? He wasn't in a place of fire. He was inside a covered place, a grave, if you like. Uh, the fish. And then there was Jesus. It's written about Jesus, recorded in Acts 2 verse 27, you will not leave my body in the grave, nor will you let your holy ones see corruption. So when Jesus died, he went to the grave, to hell, the old English Bible says, and God brought him up out of it. So then hell is the grave, and I mention that because God loves us, and he says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't enjoy punishing people. So he wants to save people, and the idea of him literally punishing somebody forever and ever in a literal flame is not what the Bible teaches. This sort of idea has been used to kind of manipulate people, to make people fear that they should go to church, or that this, that, or the other will happen, some terrible punishment, whatever. But that, that's manipulation. That, that's not what the Bible actually says. So, just to summarize, I, I said that the gospel was preached to Abraham, and these promises were of everlasting life on the earth, that we really can rise from the dead, that death is not all for us, and we really can live forever and ever and ever in God's kingdom on the earth. But the promises were to Abraham and his seed, who was Jesus. And if we want to identify with Jesus, Paul says we must be baptized into Christ. Because then we are no longer alone in this world. We have somebody. We have him in heaven. And all that is true of him is true of us. And we shall live forever because we are in him. That's why at the end of the Gospels, Jesus says, go into all the world, this is Mark 16, 15, preach the Gospel to the whole creation. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. So it's not just belief. As James says, faith without works is dead. We must do something. And we believe and we are baptized. 
So we must be baptised if we want to be saved. In John 3, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, except one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So I think that's John's way in his Gospel of putting the same truth, that you must be baptised to be in God's kingdom. Unless someone is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is why as you read the New Testament and you read the Acts of the Apostles in particular, you see them obeying this command. They go out, they preach the gospel, and people are baptised immediately. In Acts chapter 2, thousands of people heard the message and said to Peter, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptised. And they did that same day. And Paul was in prison in Philippi. There was an earthquake. And the jailer wanted to kill himself in the middle of the night, in the middle of the earthquake. Paul says, don't do that. Preach the gospel to him. And that same hour of the night, the, the jailer was baptised. He didn't say, ah, oh, yeah, let's wait till tomorrow, let's wait till we cleared up after the earthquake. He saw the need for it. When Acts chapter 8, this Ethiopian, this official from Ethiopia, who's returning from Jerusalem, reading the prophet Isaiah, wanting to understand, and God sends Philip to him to explain, and as they're travelling along, Acts 8 verse 36, the official says, Look, water, what's stopping me from being baptised? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. <coughs> he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So the eunuch commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptised him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip. So then baptism involved going down into the water and coming up out of the water. And that's because baptism represents death with Jesus. When you go into the water, it's like burial. Come up out of the water, it's like resurrection. And this is what makes us in Christ. This is what gives us the definite hope of the resurrection of the dead. Paul talks about this when he writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. He says, Brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant that our fathers, the Jewish fathers, were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, he means the Red Sea, and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Well, you remember how it was they were in Egypt, building pyramids, living in slavery, and God saw they didn't want that existence, just day by day existence, day after day, existing day by day. They wanted freedom, and that is surely like us. And so the way out was to come out of Egypt through the Red Sea, the sea di divided, there was water on both sides of them. And it also says in Exodus that there was a cloud on top of them. Now, Paul very carefully notices this and he says they were baptised in the cloud and in the sea. So there's water on top of them, water both sides of them. They were, as it were, surrounded by water. And so it opens out a wonderful parable that they had been in Egypt, in slavery, living pointless life, just existence like a lot of people do today, day by day, um, believing wrong things. And God took them out of there they went through the water and they came not immediately into the promised land, they came into the wilderness, into the desert. And so God fed them every day with manna, which I suggest is the Bible, the Word of God. We've got free Bibles there, loads of them, you can see a whole table full of them. Encouraging people to read the Bible every day for themselves. And that at the end of the journey, if they kept on the journey, they would come to the kingdom of God. But of course, they were human and they wanted to go back to Egypt, just like we do at times, that the world can seem more attractive. Even though 
we all ought to know that there is nothing back there, that we don't want to go back, we want to go forward. And so we very much, through baptism, become on a journey towards God's, God's kingdom. Now, <clears throat> baptism, as I've said, connects us with Jesus. We become in Christ. And I mentioned that Jesus was the son, the descendant, the seed of Abraham and also of David. That's how Matthew begins his gospel. That means that he was a literal descendant of Abraham and David. And that, of course, was through Mary. His mother, Mary, would have, would have been, by genealogy, if you like, directly in the line of Abraham and David. And then the angel, Gabriel, appears to her, and it's recorded in Luke 1. And I'll just read this from Luke chapter 1, from 30. The angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, you shall conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Now, the idea of conceiving means that Jesus began, he was conceived inside her. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High, and God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. And he will reign over that, the house of Jacob forever, of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I do not know a man? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy Child which is begotten within you shall be called the Son of God. So then, God was his father, and Mary was his mother. And he was the descendant of Abraham and David because he was born of Mary. That's why the angel said, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. Now, if David was his ancestor, it would seem to me then that Jesus did not exist physically, literally, before he was born. And we read here that this miracle of conception was possible because the power of the Most High will come upon Mary, the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the power of God. Not a personal being, not a God itself, but a, the power of God. And God is called the Most High. He shall be great, Jesus will be great, and shall be called the Son of the Most High. So if Jesus is the Son of the Most High, it follows then that Jesus is not God himself. God is the Most High, and Jesus is the Son of God. There is one God who is the Father. So Paul says in Corinthians, so Isaiah says. So this Jesus, who was the seed of Abraham, had our human nature because he was the child of Mary and Mary was an ordinary woman because you know, she was not the mother of God if Jesus is God then Mary was mother of God Jesus was the, the, the son of Mary as well as the son of God and Mary was directly in the line of Abraham and David and that's why he was the descendant, the seed of Abraham and David. I'd like to read from Hebrews 2, 14 to the end. Since then the children shared in flesh and blood, that's us, Jesus also himself in like manner partook of the same nature so that through his death he might bring to nothing him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So Jesus had exactly the same nature as us. He also himself, in like manner, partook of the same nature. Five times saying the same thing. So that through his death he might bring to nothing the devil. And I suggest that that shows then that the devil is really another way of talking about our own flesh. But that's another story. So Jesus is five things, he also himself in like manner partook of the same nature <coughs> so that he might deliver all those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage so 
we no longer need to fear death if we're in Christ. Not to angels does he take hold in association, but he took hold of the seed of Abraham. So Jesus was not an angel, unlike what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. He was of our nature because his mission was to save us. In all things, I continue reading here, he had to be made like his brothers. That's us. So that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest to make uh, or to get forgiveness for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered temptation, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So Jesus was tempted. And temptation means that you have a choice to the right or to the left. That you can choose to be obedient or disobedient. Jesus had that real choice. Now, he chose right every time, and we don't. So he had the possibility of sinning. He did not sin, but he could have done. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in all things, but did not sin. Let us therefore draw near with boldness to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help us in our time of need. But how are we tempted? Jesus was tempted like us. We just read that. James 1, verse 13. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he tempts no one. So God can't be tempted, but Jesus was tempted. You can't see God, but men saw Jesus. God can't die, but Jesus died. James goes on, but each man is tempted when he's dragged away by his own lust, his own desire, and enticed. Then the lust, when it has conceived, carries sin, and the sin, when it's full grown, brings death. So then, temptation comes from within. We all surely know that, that we see something, and there is an internal thought process within us that makes us want to get that thing and it leads us into death, into sin and then to death. So Jesus was tempted. He had that same nature, that same process of temptation and association uh, within his own mind that, that we do. And when we say that Jesus is with us, that Jesus is our friend, well, yes, this is all because Jesus had our nature, he knows our hunger, our pain, our hurt. All, all these things are known to Jesus because he had our nature. So again, we talk about Jesus is my friend, Jesus is with us. What do we mean by this, putting meaning into words? What I think the Bible means by those terms is that he had our nature and knows exactly how we feel. And therefore, he can save us. And also, he fellowships with us. He walks with us. And there is no situation that we have that he cannot identify with. And we may say, but how can he identify with me completely? How? Well because of the unique person that he was. He had our nature, and yet he never sinned. And yet he passed through all our human experiences, death itself, suffering, pain, betrayal, <clears throat> temptation to sin, etc. He went through all this. That's why I think this is important. Because he is there listening to our words. He knows our lives, your life, your life, my life, everyone's life. He knows exactly the path that we have been. And he, he has felt every part of the journey with us because he was human. He had our nature. All the way through the Gospels, you, you see this. When you say, well, who was Jesus? Well, read the Gospels. And what do you find there? You see him hungry, thirsty, weak, Sleeping. Sleeping so soundly that they couldn't even wake him up once on the boat. In John 5.19 he said, The son can do nothing of himself, but only what he sees the father doing. He said, I can do nothing of myself. 
John 5 verse 30. I do not seek my own will, but the will of him that sent me. I can of myself do nothing. I'm quoting his words. <coughs> so he's saying that his will was not the will always of God. He said, I don't seek my own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's tempted not to go the way of, um, of the cross, he says in the end, he says to God in prayer, but not my will, but your will be done. And especially you see this on the cross when he dies, when he says, Matthew 27, 46, my God, why have you forsaken me? So Jesus calls God, my God. And he felt forsaken. And he felt then that somehow he was alone, he had a crisis, if you like, he didn't sin uh, in that, but he still felt that, and he calls God my God. He talks about, in John twenty seventeen, I go to my Father, who is your Father, to my God, who is your God. So I'm emphasizing this because this is very much what Jesus must mean for us today. Someone who is alive and real and with us, not simply a, a picture on a wall, an icon, an idea in our head, but someone who, who is for real, where two or three are gathered together. He said, there am I in the midst of you, and he's here in the midst of us. And yeah, he said in John 14, 28, my father is greater than I. All the way through, you see this emphasis. And this has meaning because he is there for us today. And he wants, desperately wants, a relationship with us. And so this is why we encourage people to, to read the Bible, to study the, the things of the gospel, and to be baptized. Just simply, not into any <coughs> denomination, not into, uh, you know, not like with Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever, where you've got to tick all these boxes um, and do this and do that, and jump through hoops but simply into Jesus. And we really encourage people to do that and we're very happy to help anyone who would like to be baptized into the Lord Jesus. So I don't know if anyone's got any uh, comments or questions they'd like to, uh, to raise. <coughs>